My dear family in Christ, sisters and brothers, may you know the love of Christ today and every day. May it fill your hearts. May it permeate your souls. May His love fill you that you might not only receive it, but be those who reflect it and share it with others. Let's bow our heads now and go to our gracious Lord. Lord, You have sent Your Son Jesus as the greatest act of love. For in Him we have hope and we have salvation. We have promise. We have the assurance of eternal life. Lord, help us to live each day with this hope and promise. But not only to live it, but to live it out in our, our words and our actions and our deeds. Help us to live out your love and in the way that we treat others, in the way that we share with others. Help us to live out your love. In the way that we look upon others, that we would see each of them as your unique and wonderful creation. And may we show each other your love, not our broken love, but your true love. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at different elements of stewardship. We looked at how God's grace gives us the ability to be generous, as we've seen His generous generosity in giving His only Son for us. We've seen how faith transforms not only the way that we look upon giving to church, but how it meant to transform the way that we look upon giving and using our, the finances, the gifts and the blessings God gives to us. Today we complete, complete our stewardship series looking at the way that love is meant to transform us, to change our hearts, to change our lives, specifically the love of Christ. But it's also LWML Sunday. And I don't know if you knew this, but this is the 75th anniversary of the LWML. 75 years the LWML has been sharing the gospel, sharing their time, their talents, their, their mites with others. 75 years in their words and their deeds. LWML, women in the Lutheran church have been sharing the gospel. But we know that it, it really, in truth, it, it wasn't just 75 years, but we can go back to the very beginning of the church because love is part of the DNA of the church. We can go back to the very beginning of when, when Christ ascended and the church began to be called the church and we see that love was part of who they were. It was part of who they were meant to be. Love for God and love for one another. I mean, hopefully you were listening, and I know it was a bit of a longer reading, but hopefully you were listening as Dolores read this morning, as she read about how important love is between one another, that Christ living in us, that God's love is made complete in us. And when Jesus was confronted with what are the two most, well, what is the most important law? He didn't him and haw, did he? He didn't think to himself and say, well, you know, it might be good to not steal or anything like that. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And what was the other, you guys? Love your neighbor as yourself. Love is part of the identity of the church. It's meant to permeate every part of the church. It's meant to fill every corner of the church. It's meant to fill our hearts and our lives. And we know this, right? We're Lutherans. We're 500 years in the making, as I saw it written somewhere recently. We're Lutherans. We, 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 we have boots on the ground in, in Florida and Louisiana and, and Texas. We're Lutherans. We have boots on the ground right now in churches in Las Vegas sharing the gospel as the city continues to re reel and, and sending comfort dogs to bring comfort to those people. We, we know all about love, right? So why on earth is there, do we need a stewardship sermon on love? If we, if we already practice it, if we already do it, if we already have all these different missions and ministries, the LWML, maybe we can all just go ahead and enjoy some of the treats they prepared for us and let's get moving. What do you guys think? You guys know? Well, apparently John didn't think that way. Apparently John didn't think that, that the church completely had their minds wrapped around the love of Christ. Because he spent not just the, the two chapters that we read from chapter 4 and chapter five of first john but it permeates the entire book of first john his first letter to the church he spent a lot of time talking about what it looks like to love god and what it looks like to love others and and i think there's a reason for that because if you go back and you look and see what john, what john's audience originally looked like we see a young church now john was not a young man john at this point had already walked many days he'd seen many sunrises many sunsets and, and, and he, was, he had been exiled to the island of Patmos. And now, just near the end of his life, the, the, his Roman captors allowed him to return home. And so important to him was to write to this young church about what love looked like. 
See, unfortunately, well, they had witnessed Christ and His love. I mean, these are first generation folks. We're not talking about people who were saying, that's what Jesus did back then. This is what, these are people who saw Jesus working, moving, acting in the world. But they'd lost sight of it. They'd lost sight because they'd allowed some of the persecution, some of the hardships of life to sneak in and to get into the way. Their, their persecution made them turn inward. And, and, and instead of focusing on God, they focused on themselves and bickering rose up and, and arguments and blame game never happened in First Lutheran Church, except for the little preschool, right? We're good there. But it, but it was happening in that early church. And so John wrote, wrote the words that we just heard a moment ago, and we're going to read them again to this young church. This this wise man who had seen many years, he wrote these words to encourage them. He wrote these words that they would know what love should look like, what their walk with God should be. Let's turn now to 1 John, the fourth chapter. Now that's near the back of the Bible, so if you flip all the way to the back and just thumb a couple pages, you'll get there pretty quick. Um, It is page 1185 in in the Red Pew Bibles. 1 John, the fourth chapter. 1 John chapter 4. If you're using your cell phone, uh, we're going to be reading from the NIV translation. So if you happen to have your cell phone, feel free. And we're going to go to, again, 1185 in the Red Pew Bibles. If you have your own, you're certainly welcome to use that. And we're going to go about halfway through our reading today. And I want you to listen closely because there's three things that, that John really calls out our attention to in terms of what it means to love God, to live as His people. By the way, if you have time, read the rest of chapter 4. It's worth it. Let's go to verse 13 now. We know that we live in Him and He in us because He has given us of His Spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in Him and He in God. And so we know And rely on the love that God has for us. God is love. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God. And God in Him. Feel free to keep your finger in the page because we'll go back there in a moment or two. I want to point out three of the things that we see in this text. First of all, part of loving God, part of our walk with God is acknowledging Him. Maybe that seems self-evident and obvious, but, but sometimes maybe it's easier said than done. Acknowledging God in the way that we talk to others, in the way that we speak with others, not just here around church when we see our church friends or our church friends when we're out in, 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 in public, but how do we interact with those in our lives who are outside of the church? Do we represent God's love to them? Do we acknowledge God to them? Then relying on the love of God. What does that mean? To rely on the love of God. Rely on His love to know His forgiveness for your sins, His promise. And to in turn reflect that same love to others. And finally, live love. Or it was right at the end there. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in Him. Live loved. Live lives that are full of love, overflowing with love. And this seems to be so counterintuitive in the world we live in today. Because we live in a world that is full of self-centeredness and anger and hate. And, and instead, we're, we're to live lives that stand out in the world. Lives that show the love of God. But what does it mean to love? What does it mean to love? I mean, it's one thing to talk about love, to, to, to talk about, uh, about the idea of love, the concept of love. But what is love? You know, if you, if you read a Hallmark card, then it's a warm and fuzzy feeling, right? It, it, it's an emotional response. It's a biochemical response. It's, it's when your heart starts to beat a little faster and your, and your, and your blood pressure goes up and, and you get a little warm, right? The problem is, 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 is if love is just a feeling, feelings come and feelings go, don't they? Thankfully, the Scripture gives us a little bit more of a clear understanding of what love is. This is not Berkey's opinion on what love is, but this is straight out of Scripture. There's just a couple verses before we read today. Verse 10, I want to just read this to you because it's so nice when Scripture does this. It doesn't happen all the time, but this is love. That's how the verse starts out. This is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. This is love. 
You know, so many things in Scripture, we, we, we say, well, that's kind of your opinion, and, and you think your way, I'll think my way, and maybe eventually we'll meet somewhere in the middle. No, 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 not in this case. Scripture is very clear. Love is not just an emotion. Love is not just a response to, to somebody who makes us feel happy or someone who makes us feel warm and fuzzy. Love is self-sacrifice, and God showed us that great love in His Son, Jesus, when He gave His only Son. What's more is if we read the vocabulary there. Many of you maybe know this word. It's the word agape or agapao. The the first one is the noun, the second one is the verb. That word, we always translate it love. Everywhere in in the New Testament when we see that word, we translate it love. But it really has its roots in that idea of self sacrifice. What is love then? It is self sacrifice, it is putting God, it is putting others before ourselves. And this is when, and you all who have lived in marriage for 40 years or, or 30 years or even 10 years, you know that love is not a feeling because if it was a feeling, then marriage comes and marriage goes. But if love is more than that, if love is caring for the other person enough to put them first, you see those marriage surviving, 60-year marriages. Because instead of putting ourselves first, we put the other person first. The same is true in our relationship with our church family, with our God. As we put Him first, our love for Him comes first. It's not all about us, but all about Him. It's not all about what is best and what makes us feel good, but it's about what God loves and His love dwelling within us. Now again, it can be hard when we think about love and we think about, well, how does that look in a practical sense? Because I, know, I don't know about you, but, but it's one thing to, for my family to hug and kiss them, and that's one way of showing love. But, but what about you know, our neighbors at church? Sure, we hug and kiss some of each other, but not everybody's comfortable with that. I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians 13. Now, I, I know this is a familiar text, but I really would like you to read it with me because it's, it, it's worth your time because so often we skim through it because when Paul gets into his list writing modes, uh, we, we just skim right through It's page 1114, 1114 in those pew Bibles. And we're going to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And and I want you, even if you don't read the list on the page with me, I want you to listen. And I want you to think about what love looks like in a very real way in this world. Love is patient. We're starting at verse 4, by the way. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs, love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth, it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres, love never fails. Now, so often, this is not a complete list by Paul. But sure is a list that kind of gives us an idea of what love is meant to look like in the world. And I want you, though, to look at this and see where are there places where maybe your love is not all that it should be. Are there spots in your own life where maybe your love for God, your love for your neighbor is not as patient as it should be? Maybe you, you get into a hurry and you rush around and, and you're tired of waiting for others and, and so you bowl forward and push forward without making sure everybody's on the same page with you. Maybe your, your love sometimes, it, it, it does it, it turn into a bit of enviousness, boasting. And you look around you and you say, you know what, I'm doing this for the church and I'm doing this for my family and I'm doing this and, and you know that is so much more than she's doing. Or maybe your your love sometimes gets put aside because your anger gets in the way. You snap back, you say things you don't mean, you fly off the handle and when you look back you regret it, but the damage is already there. Maybe sometimes it's hard for your love to delight in truth, instead delights in evil. Half truth here and a half truth there. Well, that's not so bad after all. I mean, it's a it's a white lie. So, who's it really hurt? Can you honestly say that your love always protects, always trusts, 
always hopes and always perseveres, that your love never fails? If we're honest, we would say no. If we're honest, we know that sometimes we love ourselves more than we love others. But thanks be to God. Thanks be to God we have a God who loves us and His love never fails. Thanks be to God we have a love from our God that never runs out. It never gives up on us. The love of God never fails because of Christ Jesus, His Son. Because of Christ's death and resurrection. Because of His promise for you and for me. You know, when the, this morning as the Lord was reading, and we saw this word last week too, and, and, I, and I failed to explain it to you all, but I want to take a moment now. There's this big $5 word, propitiation. You want to say that with me? Propitiation. I know it's kind of hard for some of you to say. That's okay. If you just remember that it's in that, in, uh, that chapter 4 there. But Propitiation. That is not just a mean, maybe just immediately hear the word payment. But when you see that word propitiation, it goes all the way back to the Old Testament for us. It focuses us all the way back to God's promise 4,000, 5,000 years ago. To His promise that He made in a garden. A promise that He made to Adam and Eve. A promise that He would never fail them and that He would one day redeem them. And in Christ, He kept that promise. Up until that time, though, the sacrificial system, always though meant to point to Jesus. And that's where that word propitiation comes from. It goes back to the sacrificial system. The payment that was made on behalf of a person for their sins. Never was it a sheep or a goat or two turtle doves, but always Jesus. Every one of those goats, every one of those lambs, every one of those birds was meant to point us to Jesus and the blood that He shed on the cross. When you see that word, know that word is synonymous with God's love for you and for me. Know that the love of God never fails. It never runs out. That when you rely on Him, He will always be there for you. When you trust in Him, He will give you the strength that you need. When you put your hope in Him, He will not disappoint. Love in Christ is strong and living as we just sang Love in Christ is strong and living. It is meant to be lived out in our lives and our world. When we live our lives in stewardship to God, we look at not the obligation of being the God's people, of being God's people, but the opportunity of living as His people, living loved, serving others, acknowledging Him and relying on Him. When you look at your life, when you look at the world around you, you will see that there are so many places where God has given you opportunity to share His love. You don't have to go far. Even in our own community, we find ourselves struggling at this time, reeling at this time, knowing that there are those who need our love. Dear people of God, we have that opportunity, that, that we have that chance to share God's light, to share His love with others we open our eyes and we see all those who God puts in our lives. Let's take a moment now to bow our heads and, and, and let's seek God's wisdom, His guidance where He is leading us. Lord, You have loved us with an everlasting love. A love that never fails and never gives up, never runs out. For when all else passes away, Your love remains. You have said that to us in Your Word. Help us, Lord, to live lives of love. Those that, uh, in our lives around us, those that in uh, far reaches of the earth, may we show your love however you may have in mind. Lord, sometimes it's hard for us to see though. Sometimes it's hard for us to recognize where we might reflect your love. Open our eyes, Lord, so we might see the opportunities you place before us. Open our eyes so that our words may not only be words, but we may put them into action so that we as your people may not only love in word, but in deed as well. And Lord, let us see your opportunities that you provide us as true opportunities, as chances to share that love wherever we may go, whoever we may see. Lord, help us to be your beacon of light in this world. Help us to be those who proclaim your good news, your forgiveness, and your hope. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.